My name is Jerry, and I work at Skillpill, just is right behind you there. And uh, I wanted to just take you know a few minutes to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that's going on in learning, and ma hopefully make it interesting to you as well, and share some insights into the things that we do. It's by no means the last word, but I kind of feel that we're on, a, on, a, on an interesting journey, and uh, you've seen some stuff already around here on virtual reality and augmented reality and all these cool things. And I want to just share kind of some insights we've had uh, on, on that space as well. Um, there are, uh, if you so wish, there's a version of this that will be available, uh, slides and uh, an e-learning program. So you can get free access to that if you ask Bianca at the back. We're running a competition as well, so you can get an avatar of yourself if you say hello to ba Bianca nicely as well. That's me on the left, by the way, as well, just so you can check. I, I use the word verisimilitude, and I use it very wisely indeed. Okay, let's start off. So I want to talk about um, the idea of uh, some of the things that are going on in the outside world that may impact the inside of the business as well. So um, the reality is there's always a gap between what we do in business and what we do outside of business. You know, our ne nephews, nieces, kids and stuff are doing cool things with all sorts of digital devices. And then we go back into the workspace and we've got a bit of a grunt of a machine that we've got to work off, that we've got to share and so on. So there's always a bit of a gap. But at the same time, we're beginning to borrow some of the modes of consumer world, interesting social game, blah, 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 and bring them into the workplace. And I want to just see whether there are some things going on in the world of cloud that might also impact what's happening as well. Because it's quite a profound thing that's going on in cloud. And uh, in a nutshell, what it looks to do is open up markets to people. So if you were a, a taxi driver and then suddenly you're an Uber driver, you, know, you don't have to go through the knowledge the way that a taxi driver in a hackney cab needs to do when he or she needs to go through you know, three years of learning, uh, 320 routes in London, uh, 22 and a half thousand streets. They don't need to do that anymore. They have a sat nav and an account with, with Uber and off they go. So there's upsides and downsides to that, of course, particularly if you're a, a hackney ca a cab driver that spent three years just going through it and buying their license. You know, you see this is a rather disruptive uh, piece. But ultimately what cloud is doing is that it's anticipating and removing inefficiencies in models. So where you see an inefficiency, and I kind of speak the cloud almost in a mystical process, and I don't mean to be like that, but ultimately what happens is that you get found out and removed. So in the world, for example, of music, we are listening to more and more music these days, but 90% of the value of the music business has disappeared in the last 10 years. Okay, so we're listening to it more and more, because we're able to, but there's less and less value from a publishing perspective in, in it as well, which is why now people spend so much money on concerts, because that is the way of actually getting the money back. Used to be the concert used to promote the, the LP or the CD, uh, and now the CD or the LP actually promotes the concert. It's kind of classically deconstructed and so on. So that's interesting, but what's happened is that the cloud to a degree is removed and allow people to free, free access. As one country and western singer sang recently and rather ruefully, everything is free now. That's what they say, we've got to give it all away. But if there's consumers' expectations of that, then what happens in the world of learning? So for example, what is the impact of access to free and frictionless content for our learning population? So if our colleagues are able to go and get their own material, why do they need us to broker, anticipate, curate, enable? They don't need that anymore. They can go and find it for themselves. And it could be good stuff or it could be crazy stuff. Who knows and who cares? Well, you might care. That's the idea. So there's some cool things going on in terms of this opening up process. But at the same time, there's got some implications for us in terms of learning, in terms of our role, and shifting from mandated to self-service learning. So if we build it, will they come? So that's the idea behind the cloud. And that's some of the things I want to share with you as well. Apologies for all the, the background noise. But what I want to look at in particular, if there is a kind of an idea behind all of this, is the idea that if we wanted to create knowledge as a service, what would we need to do? So if I were to take my glasses, for example, and offer it up as a service, an absurd notion perhaps, what do we need to do to my glasses to turn it into a service? And in the same way, that's a physical thing, but if we took knowledge or skills and turned that into a service, what does that look like in practice? So if I go back to my idea earlier of the, ha of the uh, uh, Hackney uh, uh, cab driver, he or she will have to go through a huge amount of semantic knowledge in order to learn all of these routes and to pass and get the certificate or the, the, uh, the license to be uh, a, a driver. And in fact, they've neurally scanned uh, a taxi driver and they've noted that some of the actual midbrain activity has changed as a result of this. 
kind of a rather scary prospect, actually, nearly scan a taxi driver, but uh, there you go. Now, if you look at the other side of it, you've got a sat nav, and you need a little bit of procedural knowledge to be able to work it, don't underestimate that. But it'll take you to where you want to go, and it can perhaps do some live traffic feeds to reroute you as well. And you don't need to do that. So to a degree, there's been a jump. But if we were talking 20 years ago, and I was explaining that you're in a car, and there's a sat nav above your car, and when you get to a T-junction, it'll tell you to take a left rather than a right you would think this is absolutely nonsense. But in fact, it's so normal now, even me bringing this up seems mildly absurd. So in the same way, if we look at enterprise learning, which is where we're rooted, and we begin to look at the things that we can begin to delegate to the equivalent of a sat-nav, what would those things be? And what are the things then that move towards face-to-face -to -face learning? We're digital partners with London Business School, and as I frequently communicate to them, they're in danger of becoming an academic health spa, you know, where people get sent to be fixed and think about things and reflect. No bad thing in reflection, by the way, of course. But what are the things then that need to go digital? Because in reality, the senior executive program, which is a six-week residential program, is under huge threat. Who is going to go away for six weeks these days? Unless you're sent there, of course, just to get you out of the office. Yeah? Six weeks away for you, six weeks off for the rest of the office. So there's some interesting things going on in terms of this disintermediation. Let's go back to the idea of learning and, and removing inefficiencies. London Business School and other learning providers will acknowledge that within six weeks of a learning intervention, unless it's really quickly embedded, 85% of that content is lost. London Business School charges £20,000 plus per day for a custom program. Multiply that by 85% and you've got something that is ripe for disintermediation. Okay? That's not to replace face-to-face -face learning, because I think for soft skills it's pretty essential, but it's to begin to manage through that inefficiency, because that is where cloud and technology will begin to kick in. So if you're looking for return on investment or the sweet spot or all of those things, look for that as an inefficiency, and that's where cloud will begin to actually get involved. So if we want to offer things as a service, what happens and what does that look like? First of all, you've got to anticipate kickback from those that are invested in an economy of doing things. Our content partners, Pearson Education, going through some huge change at the moment because the world of publishing, guess what, is under massive challenge from the cloud. Free textbooks, people want to look at it on iPads, in secondary schools, and so on, yeah? And as a result, you know, one in 10 people in the business are losing their job right now as we speak. And it's tragic for that. But you're going to have a whole bunch of disruption and people who have an emotional investment in, for example, physical books, may get moved to one side. So depending on where you are emotionally, commercially, or whatever invested as to how you look at some of these things. If you're not invested that much, you think it is wonderfully energizing and enervating, and let's, start a, let's get a startup going, get some money, and let's jump into it. Comment in the water is lovely. But when you re invest it in a different economy, you'll see it as a challenge and you'll drag your feet. And that's absolutely natural. And depending on where we are is depending on how we support things. So I want to go back to 1999 and look at knowledge as a service. And this is where I think it started off. And this is uh, Keanu Reeves. And this is a, a kind of a 90 second vignette, which I always kind of go back to. And apologies to those of you who sat in this program before. Thank God he's wheeling out the matrix again. Has he got no more strings to his bow? But I do like it because it makes about five abstract points really, really quickly. So Malik, I'm going to try and play this now and see does it roll. We might need to jack up the audio even further on this because there's a, a rave going on next door. Inside that thing. Not yet. Operator. Tank, I need a pilot program for a B-212 helicopter. Hurry. Let's go. Okay, there's Keanu there in all his glory. <clears throat> At times when I'm struggling, maybe doing some knowledge mapping or curriculum competency framework mapping, I always say to myself, what would Keanu do? So there's about five things going on here that I think are kind of interesting. And if we had more silence and microphones, I could easily toggle around, we could have a chat. So let's just imagine that's really happening and you're shouting out wonderfully wise things to me as we're doing this. And looking at you, it would be wonderfully wise, no doubt about that. Um, trust me, I'm a consultant. Um, first thing, where does this learning intervention take place? OK, 
okay? Not in a classic environment. So it's on the top of a building, okay? So anytime, anywhere. Now most of these are bleeding obvious, but there's one that's less obvious, so I'm gonna get to that in a dramatic reveal at the end. So the first time, anytime, any place is important, okay? Because if we don't offer people learning content at a time and convenience that they need it, unless you make them do it, they won't do it. So Zipcar, part of uh, Ava's budget group, have got an app on their phone. You can find out where the local car is, and then you can use the app to actually open up the car and off you go. You got a moment of need and off you go. Yeah, anytime, anywhere convenient. You get a golf, maybe have it slightly kicked up and battered and stuff, but it'll still get you from A to B and you drop it off again. So that idea of convenience is absolutely core to as a service. Take my glasses as a service, now let's take a car as a service. Okay, not leasing, not renting, not buying. We're actually having it as a service, which is defined by anytime, anywhere convenience. Okay, it's the first thing. Secondly, there's got to be some kind of connection going on. So she's got a Motorola, which have been bought and sold a few times since that clip. That's the world of technology for you. But she's got the ability to get through to a knowledge hub really, really quickly. There's a bit of marketing communication needed there as well, folks, never to be underestimated. We need to do uh, an education program on our colleagues to show them where stuff is and how to go and get it really quickly, because otherwise they won't go. If we build it, at, will they come? They won't. Okay, take my <laughs> word for it, they won't come. Some early adopters will come for sure. The people who are self-directed will come, but the folks who need the stuff won't bother. Okay, they won't care or they'll feel that they already know it. Okay, and that's where we need to go with it. So that's the second thing, we've got some kind of connection on a knowledge hub, right? Third thing is, Kiana says to her, can you fly that thing? And she says, not yet. So there's an acknowledged skill gap, okay? That's very, very important, because why would I bother to learn stuff that I know already? Now this comes ultimately down to a question of trust. Do you trust your colleagues to identify their own skill gaps and then to self-medicate? Maybe, maybe not, depending on where you come from. If you're in a heavy regulated environment where you've got a lot of mandated learning being shoved down their throats, then you've got less trust because you just got to get on with it. But if you want to go from a tick box exercise of compliance to a culture of compliance, then you do need to trust them more. Okay, and behind that is the shift from the 1950s Kirkpatrick model of the learner as an object to the learner as a subject. That's a big shift, because we go around here talking about engaging with learning, but engaging with learning isn't just about gamifying or virtual reality or pimping up my learning to make it sexier. That can be done. The reason why people are disengaged or unengaged is because they don't feel a sense of agency for the learning. They cannot co-create the solutions. And as a result, they are passive in the system, and no matter how cool the environment is, and how much you've spent with this scenario planning, they are still an object in it that's been tracked. And as a result, they will be um, intrinsically unengaged. They may posture and say, this was fabulous, but we know ultimately that if left to their own devices, you'll go from 100% uptake, like the elections in North Korea, through to 6% uptake. All right? Not so good. Same investment, by the way. So the third point, then, is acknowledge skill gap. Kind of important, but that's a lot to do with culture. And that's also to do with organizational silos and sometimes to do with kind of um, industry silos as well. Healthcare, financial services, very he heavily regulated, retail less so and so on. Okay? So what have we got so far? Anytime, any place, can you fly that thing? Some kind of connection, some marketing communication around awareness of where that knowledge hub is. Fast access, and finally this comes to my more profound point, and this is where digital learning mostly fails, is that it does not imply a compelling event. If your colleagues cannot identify a relationship between a diary entry and self-service learning, they probably won't bother, okay? So you need to be clear what event is being implied by the learning object. I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna give you an example of that. I'm still getting quizzical looks here. We, uh, we do digital mapping with London Business School. They'll have a week-long program on learning strategy and change. And they'll see us as the ability to summarize and to port and migrate and track it. It's not the point, that's, that's not smart. What you want to do is say to your topic experts, when and where are people going to use this stuff? And they go, what do you mean? You go, well, this stuff on strategy and change, and your client Nestle, going back to Guangzhou, where and when are they going to use this stuff? So we've got to go through and grab the material and route it through so that the individual can say, I'm about to start a change effort. I'm seeing some emotional resistance to change and I need to deal with it. In other words, you need to x-ray the content and look for those inflection points, those events where they're going to use it. And unless that is actually identified, 
in the summary or the naming convention of the material, they probably won't look at it. So you need to be really clear that the tire needs to hit the road on this. When and where am I going to use this? And we found this to our own, not cost, but to our own education, that people wouldn't go in and look at some material unless they were really clear what it was. One of our best skill pills is called managing scope creep, but nobody was looking at it. And it's like, well, they don't like the word managing, and they're not really sure what scope creep is. So guess what? They don't bother. And now we have to invent a system that if you hover over the object, it actually gives you a five-point summary in it before you bother going in. This is what we talk about, a retailing perspective. And our day today is all about retailing as well. How do you sell to people better? And look at how fantastic retailers are. I see somebody from John Lewis at the back. How fantastic retailers are to invite you in, to set things out beautifully. And John Lewis has a fantastic men's collection for the summer at the moment. Some nice rustic colored t-shirts that I got my, ha my hands on. So the point I'm making is that we need to emotionally engage with people better. And we need to be really clear when and where they're going to look at it. And if not, they probably won't look at it. So back to Keanu and his, his uh, compatriot. They need to be able to fly that helicopter because the bad guys are coming up the stairs and they need it quick. So back to the retelling. You've got a five minute window between identification of need. I need to have a conflict conversation at four o'clock. It's an inflection point. I, once I've started, I can't take it back. Two, where is the stuff? Do we have any material on this? Let me find it and I'm done. That's a five minute window you've got. So if you're sitting on a Blackberry curve on the Houston road, yeah, with a two and a half G environment, trying to spool through some protocols to get onto your learning management system, you will lose the will to live. And your five minutes will probably have passed before the Blackberry God bless us has gone to Canada to collect a proxy server to go back to blah, blah, blah. You see what I mean? So it's, we are now in the world of grab and go, unfortunately, where managers and colleagues react to events. Think of it at the checkout desk. You've arrived in for something and you've exited with a bag of almonds covered in nuts. You didn't go in for it, but that's what you've come out with. And that is not an accident. So you need to manage the aisles and the trajectory and so on. I'll come back to retailing in a second. So those are the five points around Keanu. Okay, and that's why I like that clip because it makes a number of profound things about cloud that are broadly quite abstract, epistemologically, but actually you root to a sp series of specific operational things that you need to do. Okay, so our friends at Accenture have a really long infographic um, there's a link to it on the, on the website with the slides on it anyway, and so I want to kind of acknowledge that it's their work. But what I really liked about it is that they took a system and said, if you want to take my glasses or your learning objects and turn them into a service, why would you want to do that? Because your colleagues are maybe looking for convenience and just-in-time content so that you can encourage them to use it. If you wanted to run it, here are the things that it needs to be able to do. Some of these are pretty obvious, and some of these are quite, actually quite interesting as well. I'm just going to identify a couple, and then I'm going to turn this into, hopefully, some learning points for you guys. So if you take those points of the infographic, and I took six of them in particular, these are the things that it needs to do. Intelligent, agile, and so on and so forth. And what we mean by intelligence is the ability to suggest and recommend, from basic level pattern matching with a vengeance up to artificial intelligence. Okay, I'm looking at what you're looking at, but I'm not doing it to track you. I'm looking at it to make sure that I personalize what you get. So if on Spotify I'm listening to 1950s modal jazz, but I instantly dislike anything with a flute, it ought to be able to take account of that and take the flute out of the equation, if it's smart. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, I quite like this. And this has been going on in music for quite some time. Pandora, the, uh, the radio station in, in the States, and so on, started that in the 1990s. It begins to stream content for you. Why shouldn't we do that for our learning population? that it begins to take account of when they look at it, their completion rates, what they react to, and then begins to pull down from a library stuff that you, they may find useful. It's kind of basic common sense in retailing, but we need to actually apply that to, uh, to the world of learning. So let me deconstruct this and then we'll wrap. So I'm all for SCORM. I love it, you know, AICC 2004 standards and all that. But ultimately to me, it bespeaks a lack of confidence in the industry. Yeah, we're talking about return on investment, and really all it's doing is measuring outputs, not outcomes and not impact, right? But we need to have something, right? So I'm not against tracking per se, but I would rather use the fantastic technology that's all around us and all of these providers have, or many of them have, to be better at selling in content. We, one of our customers has, is a bank, and we noted that coming into September time, a lot of their colleagues were looking at stress management, building confidence, being more assertive material. 
and we said there's an interesting pattern emerging across your, your calendar cycle. We've also noted that in our recommended area, six out of the 10 top looked at objects come from a recommended area. So they do like the recommended area. So why not next year coming into August, we take all the stuff on mindfulness, building confidence, work-life balance, and put that into the recommended area. Listen, this is 101 stuff. This is the equivalent of Sainsbury's running some barbecue stuff over the summer. Why wouldn't it, yeah? And make it easy to get a hold of. Because guess what? That maps against the way I want to live my lifestyle throughout the year. And in the same way in work, let's look at the circadian rhythm of our colleagues. Get, get up and running on a Monday, reflection Friday. All of these things to begin to work out the moods in which people look at material. The, the data is available and the content is available and the thinking is already out there. But it's a matter of joining the points and winning a major prize. So let's move past just using tracking to track. And instead use tracking to sell and be smarter. Okay? Back to my earlier point as well about agile. Fast, fast access. I've got a need, can you fulfill it? You've got five minutes, clock is ticking now. And if you're thinking there's no way our system will be able to manage that, then maybe go for a system that can manage it. Again, we're now moving towards almost like a slack for learning these days, where you can pull in differing objects, moving away from walled gardens of content. You can only have our material. Allow people to have a dashboard of differing materials to call them in. So to be able to kind of swap in and swap out learning objects ought to be the way that, that it's going. But also as well allow people to ad uh, adapt and course adjust based on the discussions and learning that is happening. This still may be uh, a, a wish rather than a, something that's happening right now, but there's nothing stopping you asking these questions. How quickly can we do these things? And as well, if you've got a fragmented audience, uh, different language and cultural issues, the ability to give something meaningful and personalized, but also uh, retain the sense of scale is really important. We're working on a really interesting project for uh, the government to save the children at the moment, where we're creating and deploying content over apps to volunteers and aid workers of the European refugee crisis. So we've got to look at all of the things that are going on, all the different motivations, but the idea is to provide material to homogenize to a degree the disparate behaviors and professionalize some of the behaviors as well in Calais and in Greece as well. And I'm going to post up on my LinkedIn how we get on with that. We've been running a four-year uh, voluntary project with Save the Children on different things, but this is a really interesting one. If a customer or an internal business partner turns around to you and says, I'm, I'm running a sales enablement program and I need it ready for next Thursday, can you create and get that up and running for them? Or will you say, I'll tell you what we'll be able to do. We'll be able to meet next Thursday to talk about it. All right, I'm exaggerating, I'm sorry. Back in the early 90s, one of my early consulting jobs was with the Budweiser Company, run by a com uh, an organization called Anheuser-Busch, run by August Bush III, who's a very committed individual. Let's put it that way, let's, let's say it nicely. Very committed individual. When his son August IV was born, he got christened with a thimbleful of beer poured over his forehead. Welcome to the family, son. But in, in, he had a, news a newsletter to shareholders, and he said, in all the things we do as a corporation, they were at the time the biggest uh, brewers of beer in the world, the biggest uh, company uh, recycling aluminium, one of the first companies ever to uh, have a social responsibility project back in 1870. He said, in everything we do at Anheuser-Busch, we must never forget. And he finished off the newsletter with a big circle, and he wrote inside it, sell more beer. And if you're sponsoring an art gallery or doing something with a retailer, you need to demonstrate to Augie the Third at the time, how are we selling more beer with this? Why am I saying this? When you're looking at a London Business School project or your own internal initiative, ask yourself the question, how is this going to help us make or save money? You may not have an easy answer to that, but the question itself will add rigor. And then you'll be less obsessed with talking about return on investment and SCORM tracking and all that stuff, and instead show how you become a decent business partner. Okay? And let's not disappear into the amorphous abstract about transformation. All good and stuff, and brand and yada yada. Instead, building trust. What we need to do is sell more beer, okay? And then you can build out from there. Let's not lose sight of that. I'm using beer as a metaphor here, by the way. So, so let me wrap up then with some questions. Very unfair questions in some ways. We do some voluntary work with Save the Children and we do some paid for work with Don Humby, Tesco Club Card.
but these are potential ways of looking at you and looking at what you do. Now, it has to be said, these folks at the center operate at a glacial pace. And I say to them again, as, my, as the classic gadfly, why don't you get some folks out from Rwanda or Ethiopia to come and run your central office for six months on a carousel basis? I'll cut through a lot of this nonsense. Yeah? Because I wouldn't be any good out there, look at me. Yet you guys are able to operate fast, effectively, with poor to no infrastructure and get critical things done. So the competence is within the organization. You just need to bring it back to the center and kick some arse, basically. Anyway, that's the value we bring there, <laughs> and so on. So those are the questions I think we could ask of our learning in terms of the beauty of design right through to the evaluation of the, of the investment that we're making and our ability to respond to events. And also as well, the use of good data to be really sharp and smart about selling better. And I think one thing that in NetNet -Net in terms of my talk today is that we need to move from a prescriptive didactic, I need to tell you more because there's an asymmetric I know more than you do, and, and you need to learn it, to hold on a sec, we don't know all the answers. We know where we need to get to, and we've agreed those, but we need you to be part of the solution, okay? And you need to contribute and get involved. Be more engaged, and if stuff isn't working for you, let us know, and we will course adjust. We're not in a Soviet era, industrial, 1980s learning management system. You may well be, by the way, but, but you need to get out of that and add the five minute rule. The identification of need through to fulfillment has to happen in under five minutes or you've lost your customer. Everybody happy? If you want your avatars, or at least enter one, tell Bianca, she'll scan you, it's fairly painless, nothing else happens after that. All right guys, thank you for your time and attention.